morning, church. Good morning, church. This is the day that the Lord has made. Amen. Hallelujah. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Happy Father's Day, and especially to all of our fathers and father figures um, out there. But we're especially excited to celebrate Juneteenth today. On this day, about 257 years ago, our enslaved brothers and sisters in the state of Texas heard General Order Number 3, which liberated and freed them all throughout the state. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is about four years after the General Pro uh, Emancipation Proclamation, and many of them were not aware that they were free. But God has a way of leading and guiding us. Hallelujah. And we are free. Amen. Hallelujah. And we're glad about it. So this is a celebration this morning. We ask that in that same spirit of freedom that you praise the Lord with us. Jesus. Jesus. Blessed Savior. He's worthy to be praised. And in your spirit, praise him. Praise
praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. It's got to come from here. Praise him. Praise him. Jesus. Jesus. Let's enjoy To the setting of the same, his name is worthy to be praised. So we glorify him and we magnify him, for he is the King of Kings and Jesus is the Lord of Lords. Amen. Hallelujah. Can y'all put your hands together with us for this one? Hallelujah. We glorify and magnify his name. Hallelujah. 
Our prayer this morning is that we continue in this same spirit of praise and worship. Amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning, Mount Zion. Good morning, Dumbarton. My name is Rachel Cornwell. I have the privilege of being the pastor at Dumbarton United Methodist Church. Um, and I want to thank Mount Zion so much for welcoming us here this morning to join you on this very special day. Uh, not only is it Father's Day, but it's also Juneteenth, and we are so grateful to be in worship with you this morning. Uh, we want to let everyone know that our worship is being live streamed on Facebook, uh, and it is being recorded. And so um, we hope that those who are joining us live uh, will also feel very welcome in this place and this time of worship. Um, and we'll feel part of this gathered community this morning. I have a prayer I want to read. I get all, get all the announcements. <laughs> I say everything. Our opening prayer this morning is a prayer for when Juneteenth and Father's Day meet. Would you pray with me? We often hear of fathers at our founding those who signed their names to the initiating documents of this nation. Many who carved out freedoms for themselves while owning other human beings. On this Father's Day, this Juneteenth, we see the blood-stained soil of American inheritance as the roots under our feet cry their stories of slaughter, enslavement, and separation where our ancestors have failed and contributed to the inequity and pain we now face, we exhale with deep lamentation. But we also on this day give thanks for the forebearers who struggled mightily to forge a future of mutuality and respect, seeking liberty and justice for all. We give thanks for those who have shaped and formed us, mopped our brows, fought unsound law, and lived a manhood absent of chauvinism. Where we have been uplifted in love and dignity, we offer full-hearted praise and thanksgiving. Creator, Grandfather, Instill us now with the strength of those who sang out in Galveston, 1865, when the word finally came of the Emancipation Proclamation. Teach us to be parents and children who, like Christ, walked the way of liberation. May the road we pave honor the generations still coming. May our worship today call upon Abba to set our feet toward freedom. Amen. Good morning as well. My name is Reverend Selena Johnson, and I'm also so happy to see you all here from Dunbarton. And thank you, Reverend Rachel Cornwell, for being our worship leader this morning. I'm going to invite um, Tracy to come up and read our scripture this morning. Good morning, church. Our reading this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, the verse, chapter 11, verses 12 to 14, and then 20 to 25. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Now the next day when they had, had, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he could find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering him, 
And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to him, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, Whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, Whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. This is the word of God for the children of God. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite... Uh, the female reenactors of distinction. We are going to go back in time with them. So, uh, you have an introduction for us? Yes, would you like to come up? This is a special treat for us on Juneteenth um, to have these reenactments. Well, good morning. Oh, it's so wonderful to see so many happy faces, even though they are masked. <laughs> Where are the female reenactors of distinction from the African American Civil War Museum at 1925 Vermont Avenue Northwest? And I'm just very briefly going to tell you who we are. You're going to hear from just a couple of us in the morning service. But even though you won't hear us maybe sometimes mention God in our presentations, we have to give praise and thanks to him for bringing us together. It was he who got the idea together and kept us and have brought us as far as we have come. And uh, to that, every lady here would say amen. Every lady here is special. And so those who are not with us today are certainly with us in prayer. We take the opportunity to, um, let me just say America is a great country. She may be losing her moral pinnings in some respect, but we take women you've never heard of who did great things to help America prosper and to help the population of residents do wonderful things, not only to help this country, but other countries around the world. And so when God put us together, because none of us knew each other, and we had no idea we were ever going to be doing anything like this, we had to find a purpose to stay together because the public was demanding it, more or less, that we do this. And when we did, we said, the, someone, we talked it over and thought, we must find out who the women were of the Civil War era that were born either before, during, or after the Civil War and tell their stories. Well, when we got ourselves into this, we didn't really understand what we were doing. Everybody knows Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, some of the well-known women of the time, how they changed life for many. But you probably never heard of the women that you will hear from today. And so we take the opportunity to bring their story alive and to give glory and honor not only for what they did, but for God using them the way he did. So our, our acronym FREED comes from Female Reenactors of Distinction. And um, that is why we're called that. I, I've never shared this before, but in public, but 
when we came together, I mean, we didn't know what to do. But we insisted that our name have in it ladies because the women of, of that era were not really considered ladies or looked upon with respect. And that was going to be a requirement. But as we came and week after week and talked about this thing, we thought, you know, we need an acronym that will properly describe who we are. We always know we are ladies, but we needed something that would say something in a special way of our name. And that's why one of the members found female reenactors of distinction, and then she capitalized certain letters in there to make it freed. So I present to you this morning um, a couple of our ladies who are going to give you an opportunity to see something about these ladies. Thank you. person had to take out a mortgage, uh, a chattel mortgage, to pay for their labors, which of course the enslaved person never receives. So uh, I always found it interesting that how these owners, planters, use the enslaved people, not only for field work or kitchen help or whatever, uh, even making cloth. And in those days, black people, enslaved people, that cloth was woven in such a way to be very industrious so it could last that person for at least a year or more. And so the weave was different then a poor, fine garment. So, uh, but I, I'm going to start off. My name is Hattie. I don't know how old I is, and I've long since forgot the name given to me at my birth. But the one thing I do remember is the last time I saw my mama's face. She slipped me to fetch water and I never came back. My first master told us that we were brought here to toil for the white man. My second master said that we were his property 
he knew of no law that would protect us. Well, one thing I found out a long time ago was that my blood was the same color as my master's. And my Mrs. Muffley's looked just like mine. So why am I treat, treated so differently? What makes me so different? I done nursed all of their children. So much so, I scarcely had any left for my own. I birthed six children. My youngest was no more than five years old. I can still remember him clutching after me as they took him away, screaming, Mom, Mama, Mama, please, Mama, help me, please. Just as I had screamed and hollered for my mama as they took me away. They was always talking about us slaves like they was talking about a herd of cattle. Well, I ain't ever see them beat their cattle the way they beat us slaves. On this plantation, my name is listed as Hattie, right behind them horses and pigs they bought that day. Sometimes at night when I close my eyes, I can remember my home, my true home, and my people. And I can even remember the smell and taste of the food and the drumming. Right now, in this country, in this land, the drums of war are beating all over this place. The planters are forming what they call the home guard. And they want us enslaved people to help them with home Well, if I want to help anybody, it would be my people. Because we have more blood, sweat, and tears in this here land than we, than they could ever have. My life has been one of hardship and toil. From sunrise to sunset, we toil. And we suffer all night. Sometimes when I think about my sons, I hope they're out there joining up with the blue coats. And I want them to run them ribs to ground. For the first time since coming to this land, I'm gonna run for freedom. And for the first time, I'll be able to choose my own name. <laughs> and I've 
children to be called contraband of war. And there won't be no more auction block for me. No more peck of corn for me. No more harsh words for me. But most of all, there won't be any drivers left for me. Thank you. Good morning. Let me take this off. That's better. Um, so good to be here in this wonderful church um, this morning. My name is Harriet Ann Jacobs. I was born in Edington, North Carolina in 1830. The first years of my life were happy years. I ran in and out of the big house. I didn't know I was a slave. My mistress, Margaret Honerblow, was very kind and nice to me. She taught me to read, to write, and to sew. And as you know, to teach a little Negro girl to read was certainly against the law. But nevertheless, later on in my life, that would be of great benefit to me. The first 10 years, I went about happy-go-lucky. And when I turned 11 years old, Margaret Hornablow died. She bequeathed me to her niece, who was only three years old. So she couldn't take care of me. So I was taken care of by her parents, Dr. Norcom and his wife, Maria Norcom. And all of the realities of slavery came knocking at my door. The cruelty that they lashed out towards me, I was unable to understand. So when I turned 11, Dr. Norcom was the biggest sexual threat to my existence. His wife hated me because she knew what he was up to. So those first few years, I had to conjure up something in my mind so that I could survive. But of course, my ultimate goal was freedom. So I decided to start this alliance with this white gentleman by the name of Samuel Sawyer. That alliance produced two children, Louisa and Joseph. My heart strings, my heart strings. But I also went further in the realization that I did not want my children to have the same fate that I thought that I would have. I wanted my children to be free. So I decided, along with my grandmother, who owned a house, and by the way, she was free, to pretend as if I had run away from the plantation. 
So I hid for seven years over top of her storage room, which was a crawl space not much bigger than I am wide or, or long. And I hid there for seven years reading, reading the Bible, and watching my children outside during special times when I knew no one was around to see me. And after the seven years, during the seven years rather, I asked their father, would you please purchase my children from Dr. Norcom and emancipate them? He certainly did purchase them, but what do you think didn't happen? He did not emancipate my children. So, and he became very successful. He became a member of the House of Representatives, moved here to Washington, D.C., and took my children to Brooklyn, New York. And my daughter became a house servant, which is a form of slavery, as we all know. And so I decided, forget it, I'm not gonna pretend to run away, I'm going to run away. So I had many people to help me along the way, going through swamps with snakes around and all kinds of things, safe houses. And it took me 10 years running as a fugitive slave to reach my children in Brooklyn, New York. Once I got there, I found Louisa, Joseph, and um, purchased their freedom, and decided, because Dr. Norcom kept coming back and forth, trying to find me, so I would send letters as if I was different places, but he came to New York. So I decided to take residence in Boston, Massachusetts, opened a boarding house, stayed there for a minute with my children, and then I returned to, to, Roche, to New York, to Rochester, New York. I took an 18-month residence at an anti-slavery room over top of Frederick Douglass's North Star um, publication. My brother, John, was the person who ran the anti-slavery reading room. So I knew Frederick Douglass. And after that, I decided I wanted to go back to the roots of the South. I needed to go. I went to Georgia, went back to Edington, and continued to help with the freedmen's camps and with relief efforts in those places. However, when the racial violence became so unbearable and dangerous, and I had my children with me, I'd left the South and came to Washington, D.C., where I spent time with the Freedmen's Camp, where I spent time educating the children, bandaging the soldiers, and, um, and just um, helping with any relief efforts I could. Um, moved to Alexandria, Virginia, just across, um, opened a school with Louisa in Alexandria, Virginia. Returned back south, returned back to my home because I had to tell the people in Edenton how much they meant to me and, um, and to help with any relief efforts and anything I could do there. And during this time, I had in my mind, I have more purpose. I have purpose in this life beyond what I'm doing, even though what I was doing was very, very beneficial. So I decided to write a manuscript, the Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. Wrote that and wanted to publish it. But I knew that I was directing this particular manuscript to the women in the North, but there was fear in my heart because how were they gonna receive this? I already knew the Southern women weren't going to because their fathers, their brothers, their uncles were all 
guilty of these atrocities that they committed against slave women and their daughters. And so I knew that this is what I had to do. Even though I was looked at as a woman who, who mothered illegitimate children, but there was a higher calling for that. I did. I did that with deliberate intent. Samuel Sawyer was not a lover to me. It was a way so that I could make Dr. Norcom upset and that perhaps, you know, he would have thought of freeing my children, but, but he did and, and then the story goes on. But I wrote the book. It was, um, it was greatly received in England. I traveled there, was received there. Um, but unfortunately, the cloud of the Civil War um, kind of clouded over any publications that I could have had here in the United States. Um, and so it took till ninth, the 1960s and 1970s with the Civil Rights Movement and the Women's Movement, and that's when it was discovered in 1973. It was published, printed, it's in print today. You can get on Amazon, <laughs> and it's printed today. And, um, and so I ended up returning to Washington, D.C. The last 10 years of my life were just spent in pretty much, so not much other than clubs and, um, and continuing to help with the relief efforts. I um, died in 1897 in Washington, D.C., and I uh, returned, my body returned to Boston, Massachusetts. That was my home, and my name is Harriet Ann Jacobs. My name is Charlotte Scott. You may call me Miss Charlotte. I like the sound of that. I'm a free woman now, but it weren't always so. I was born 1803, 1805, somewhere thereabouts. I'm not for sure because it didn't always keep such good records when it came to the birth of slaves. I was born in Virginia on a plantation owned by Captain William Scott and his wife, Anne. They named me Charlotte. The naming of slave children was a privilege owners would take for themselves. The Scots owned over a thousand acres of land run through by the James River, Campbell County on one side and Bedford on the other. They raised tobacco as a cash crop and they had plenty of help to do it. The Scots um, had 12 children. And um, I served all the Scott households, and I was never sold. As a young child, I was selected to act as a nurse for their children. That was a common practice to pick a slave child to be a nurse. Not because I had any medical knowledge, but really meant to keep an eye on them so they didn't hurt themselves, also to act as a companion and to entertain them. When Captain Scott died, they had nine surviving children. In his will, he left a good piece of property to the seven oldest children and the rest to his wife, Anne. Now, um, the two youngest boys, Hugh and Thomas, would get their portion when she died. But she took pity on them and turned it over while she was still living, if they prompted to take care of her until she passed on. And they did. So by inheritance, I stayed with all the Scots, from Anne when she passed, to Thomas, the youngest son, 
later to Margaret, his daughter, and their granddaughter. And Margaret married her second cousin, Dr. William Rucker. And I was loaned to her as a wedding present, you might say. But when her father, Thomas, died, she inherited me outright. Time came there was talk about going to war. And the North and South were at each other's throats. People in the South, further South, wanted to take slavery to the West. And there also was the issue of states' rights in the election of Mr. Lincoln. Well, Dr. Rucker didn't think so much of slavery, and he said as much. And that put him at odds with some of his family members and, and his Virginia neighbors. And eventually, his loose talk landed him in jail. Well, as the fighting got closer and looked more dangerous, he and Miss Margaret decided she should take their four sons, which they had at the time, and household slaves to Marietta, Ohio for safety. Well, but the Union soldiers would not transport us until she freed us first. That's how I came to be free in an Ohio. And one of the first things I did was to take a last name for, our, for myself. Did you know the slaves couldn't have last names? And nobody bothered about calling us Mr. or Miss. So I took the name Scott. That way I had a full name, Charlotte Scott. Miss Charlotte Scott, thank you. Well, in Ohio, I stayed on with the Rutgers as cook. And when the, this was 1962, and when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed by President Lincoln, it freed other slaves in rebellious territories. But it also provided that colored people could get fair wages for their labor. So I stayed on as cook, and I took in washing to earn money. With the help of some friends, Dr. Rucker got out of jail and joined, joined us in Ohio and the family was together. So me, me and the others all stayed in Ohio because we chose to, till the war was over. Well, one day I was serving breakfast to the Rutgers and there was a discussion I overheard that President Lincoln had been assassinated. Everyone was silent. They looked around at each other, didn't know what to say. So I spoke up first. I said, the colored people have lost their best friend. They should raise the monument to his memory. So I went to where I've been keeping the money I've been saving as a free woman and brought it to Dr. Rucker. And I said, Dr. Rucker, you give this money to someone honest who will help raise a fund drive from colored people to get this monument going. Now, it was turned out to be $5, and that may not sound like a lot to you today, but back then, that was all the money I had saved aside. Well, he thought it was a good idea, and he did help. Word got out in the St. Louis newspaper, and the Western Sanitary Commission was chosen to collect the money. Money started coming in from colored folks all over. And the colored troops in Natchez, Mississippi gave a good portion. They started out with $12,000. It went up to $16,000. And eventually, all told, about $22,000 was raised for that monument. A Thomas Ball was selected as the designer of the monument. He did a fine job. While well, they decided to install the monument, on the 11th anniversary of Mr. Lincoln's assassination. So on April 14, 1876, that's when they held the installation. It started out with a parade. First there were people assembling in Lincoln Park. Then they had some people creating a parade from like K Street up around the White House and down into the park where people were already assembled. And there were people on the stands dignitaries and whatnot who were going to be speakers. 
And among those speakers was Frederick Douglass. And he did a fine job, just a, a marvelous speech he gave. When they mentioned that I was there, there was a big cheer because they knew that I had begun this whole process with my suggestion of first five dollars earned freedom. And President Grant was given the opportunity to pull the cord to reveal the statue. And when it came into view, oh, there was cheers going on. This monument stood and the Congress had appropriated the base. So this bronze statue came into view and it was just a marvelous thing. And um, on that, that monument, there are two plaques, but the front, front plaque has just two names on it, Charlotte Scott and Abraham Lincoln. And let me read to you what it says on that plaque. Freedom's Memorial, in grateful memory of Abraham Lincoln. This monument was erected by the Western Sanitary Commission of St. Louis, Missouri, with funds contributed solely by emancipated citizens of the United States, declared free by his proclamation January 1st, A.D., 1863. The first contribution of $5 was made by Charlotte Scott, a freed woman of Virginia, being her first earnings in freedom and consecrated by her suggestion and request on the day she heard of President Lincoln's death to build a monument to his memory. So people, I want to say, some speak, some people talk against Lincoln saying he didn't really want to do free the slaves, that he only did it for military reasons. But let me tell you, I don't care why he did it. I'm glad he did. <laughs> so um, I just want to leave you with this idea that if you have a friend, be a friend. I consider Lincoln my friend because he freed my people. And I am his friend because I want people to remember what he had done and to keep that memory going forward. So thank you very much. And if I might step out of character for just a minute, this monument here last year was under attack. And uh, the fervor of taking down the Confederate monuments. And I uh, want to say that in character, I went down to the crowd and braved the crowd with the help of a friend and spoke to the crowd that they not tear it down because there's history in this thing. Because if you can see it, it some people say, well, it looks like uh, the man is shining Lincoln's shoes. But if you look at his face, his face is looking upward to the heavens from whence cometh his strength. And you can see that Lincoln's hand is not patting him on the head, but it's bidding him rise, no need to, to kneel. And the figure, his knee, one knee is down, but he's rising. If you look at his hand, one hand is like he's pushing off like a sprinter. And the other hand has a broken chain, a shackle on his, his arm. So this man is going for the freedom and he's acknowledging the person who freed his people. And that's why that statue has meaning. So um, I invite you to visit a, a website that uh, friends helped me develop, emancipationmonument.org. And you will learn more about this statue and what it means. So I want to thank you for listening to my story about Miss Charlotte Scott, a friend of Lincoln. Amen, amen. Let's give the freed ladies another round of applause for enlightening us to history that I did not know anything about. I did not know about the other Harriet 
or about the memorial. And I thank you, our, our other lady named Contraband of War. <laughs> she, that's what she named herself. And she told us some powerful stories. Thank you all so much. What, what a wonderful blessing. And um, so this morning, I have, a, I have just a mini message for you, because I know we've already gotten our history message. And thank you all again so much for that. But um, there is a word from the Lord. Let us pray. Awesome and holy God, thank you for this opportunity. I pray, O oh God, that as uh, more words are spoken out of my mouth and meditations are on people's hearts and words are spoken out of the people's mouths, that it would all be acceptable to you because you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So, um, most of us are United Methodists here, unless we have, I know we have a couple of visitors, but um, we had an annual conference a couple of uh, weeks ago, and our bishop, uh, Bishop Latrell Easterling, um, gave a powerful message during opening worship. And this year's theme was Persevere in Hope, Faith, and Joy. And she was encouraging the churches of the BWC to persevere. And, and Edmund will tell you, Edmund who has the camera, that he's our lay leader to annual conference. And he was texting me, he said, she is preaching. I was like, yes, she is preaching. But during the message, she reminded us um, of this saying, which says, instead of always telling God how big your problems are, you should tell your problems how big your God is. Amen? <laughs> And so um, this message this morning is called Move Mountain, and you all are going to have to participate in this message. So wake up, wake up your neighbor if you fall asleep. You all are going to have to participate. So there's a song from back in the day called Move Mountain, written by Margaret Pleasant Duroe. And in the chorus, the first part, it says, let me tell you how to move a mountain. That's too hard for you to climb. Let me tell you how to move a mountain, one that hides the bright sunshine. When your hands are bleeding and torn and your feet are weary and worn, when you try to climb up, but the rocks and reels make the going tough, just say, move mountain, move mountain, mountain, get out of my way. And so I believe that this song was inspired by our text that we had this morning. And so we are going to tell the, what seems like a mountain of racism, we're going to tell it to move this morning, amen? You're going to help. So if you recall in the text that Tracy read for us so beautifully, uh, Jesus was walking with his disciples and they saw a fig tree that uh, he thought he was gonna get some fruit from, but nothing was there. And so he cursed the fig tree to the ground and uh, it said, no one will ever eat your fruit again. Then, early the next morning, the disciples were walking down that same road, and they saw the tree again, and it was completely withered. Peter said, Rabbi, look how this fig tree has, that you cursed has dried up. And Jesus responded to them, have faith in God. I assure you that whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and doesn't waver but believes that what is said will really happen, it will happen. And so I was so grateful for those stories of faith that we just heard there, because they had to go through mountains to get to the history that they have created, these women. So also a couple of weeks ago, when we had our decoration day, some of you were there down at the cemetery. Um, I lost my keys. I just lost my car keys. It fell off of my, my chain. And um, I had some folk there, everybody was gone, most of the people were gone, but we were looking all around for my keys. And then this stranger drove, uh, drove up on her bike with her fiance, and they said, what are you all doing? I said, we're looking for my car keys. I described the keys to her and everything. She said, we're gonna find your keys. She said, I'm going to find your keys. Because she, she said, I have, I have great faith. I know, I, I'm good at finding things. And so we were looking all over for the keys, and I felt like we had already looked in all the places. And Dr. Page was there, and he said, you're going to have to call your husband to come pick you up, because your keys are not going to be found today. And I was like, that's right, I'm going to have to call my husband. But this nice lady, she's looking, so I'm just going to let them look for a minute. But don't you know she found that key? In all that grass over there, she found the key. And she, 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 see, this woman had faith. 
She had faith that she had good eyesight. She had faith that she was a good sleuth. She had faith that she could pay attention to details very well and observe things very well. However, in our text today, Jesus is telling us something even more powerful, friends. Jesus is saying, have faith in God. And you can move mountains. And so in light of Jesus' promise in Mark 11, we're about to tell the mountain of racism off. In honor of Juneteenth, we're going to tell racism off. I say in the name of Jesus, in the very presence of God, in the community of saints, we are going to tell racism off. Somebody should be clapping right there. <laughs> yes. You all are going to participate, okay? You guys are going to participate. So racism is one of those old mountains that seems like it's been around forever, for generations. And it's been 402 years and 10 months now on this soil since the first African Americans were brought on this soil in 1619 August. The mountain of racism has been around for so long that it feels like forever. It feels almost eternal. But guess what, you mountain of racism? Our God is bigger than you. Hallelujah. Our God is eternal. Our God is from everlasting to everlasting. Our God is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Before you were, O oh mountain, you evil mountain, our God was. And when you are no more, our God will still be. Hallelujah. God has the final say in all things. Somebody say, move mountain. Somebody say, our God is eternal. Yes, yeah, so number one we need, thing we need to tell that mountain is that our God is eternal and you are not. Second thing, racism says to people, some of you are more valuable because of the color of your skin. Some of you are more valuable because of the texture of your hair or the features on your face or on your body. But guess what, you mountain of racism? Our God created all of us in the very image of God. We are all stamped from the beginning with sacred worth, every one of us. In the beginning, God created them male and female in the image of God. Somebody say, move mountain of bigotry. White supremacy, get out of our way. We serve an inclusive God, one who created all, one who died for all, and one who says to everybody, whosoever will, let them come. Somebody say, move mountain. God is eternal, God is creator. Number three, racism tries to tell us that there is not enough. Racism haunts our minds with the mentality of lack. Racism tells us to hoard things. But guess what, racism? Our God is provider. Our God is Jehovah Jireh, the big provider. Our God has created enough for everybody. Somebody say, move mountain of zero sum mentality. Somebody say, move mountain of replacement theory. Say, we trust God. Hallelujah, our God is eternal. Our God is creator. Our God is provider. Number four, racism promotes hatred. Yes, it does. Racism makes us hate others, makes us fear others, makes us scorn others, makes us even harm others because they don't look like us or because they're different from us. But guess what, racism? Our God is so much bigger than you. Our God gives us the strength to love. Our God loves us even when we fail, falter, and fall. Oh, hallelujah. Our God commands us to love one another as disciples of Jesus Christ. Our God tells us to love our neighbor even if we do not know them. Our God tells us to even love our enemies. The word of God tells us that love covers over a multitude of sins. Our God inspires us to spread love. I love how the hymn writer has put it in uh, our United Methodist hymnal. It says, the Lord of love has come to me. I want to pass it on. So our God tells us to spread love, right? Yeah. I'll shout it from the mountaintop. I want the world to know the Lord of love has come to me. I want to pass it on. Somebody say, move mountain of hatred. Say, God loves me. Turn to your neighbor and say, God loves you. Somebody say, God is love. If you've got 
a mountain of fear in your own heart. You might have a mountain of fear in your own heart about how racism is oppressing you, or maybe you're afraid that you are the oppressor. You'll be called out as such. Just say to that mountain, God is love. Speak to that mountain. If you've got a mountain of anger in your heart because of racism, and it's always taking away your joy, taking away your peace, just say to that mountain of anger, say, move mountain. God is love. So God is eternal. God is creator. God is provider. God is love. Racism, God is the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. Jesus said, the truth will set you free. The truth is that racism is like a tree of evil with its roots spreading like poison, with its branch is hanging with strange fruit. The truth is that it is harmful to all of us. The truth is that it displeases God like that tree displeased Jesus. And so we curse it to the ground in the name of Jesus, just the way he cursed that tree to the ground. Somebody say, move mountain of lies. God is the truth. God is eternal. God is creator. God is provider. God is love. God is the truth. And finally, oh, you wretched mountain, we want to let you know that our God is the winner. Hallelujah. I love the way modern uh, gospel psalmist Tasha, Tasha Cobbs puts it. She said, victory is here. It's kicked defeat out the door, Caleb. Our God is doing a new thing. Get ready for overflow. Somebody say, move defeat. Move. Victory is here. Yes, our God, is e our God, the eternal creator who provides all that we need, who loves us unconditionally, who leads and guides us into all truth, in the end is what? A winner. Another contemporary gospel artist, a psalmist Jabari Johnson, puts it like this and has declared, it's a fixed fight and we've already won. Oh, hallelujah. There's so much more we could say about God to this mountain. There's so much more we could say to this mountain about our big, big God. But ultimately, we know that our God is victorious in the end. We know that our God has given us the victory. So don't be discouraged, friends. Don't be defeated. Don't be overwhelmed by any mountain. The chorus goes on to say in that song, Move Mountain, it says, let me tell you how to move a mountain when the climbing gets you down. Let me tell you how to move a mountain when you've traveled your last round. When your friends have left you behind and your way you cannot find. When your prayer is for help and you stand alone feeling by yourself, just say, move mountain, move mountain. Yes, say it, move mountain. Say mountain, get out of my way. Friends, Jesus has given us the victory. Oh, hallelujah. God is victorious over you, oh, mountain of racism. God is victorious over you, and we have the victory in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And so by way of invitation this morning, I'm going to be quick about it. Uh, the first invitation goes out to those who may not know this mountain mover, the one who said to his disciples, you can just say it out of your mouth, and that mountain will move. It's Jesus. And so if you are here today, and you don't, you're not sure if, I don't know if I really know this Jesus, or if I really believe that. I want to tell you that Jesus is the truth, and he's telling you the truth. And if there's a mountain that is beyond our control, that one mountain is the sin we all commit. For we all sin and fall short of God's glory. But you know who can move that mountain? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. He died to take the weight of the burden of that away from you so that God's light can shine on you. He'll speak to that mountain and say, move and get it out of your way. Anything that's coming between you and God, Jesus will get it out of your way. And so, as every, every eye is closed, every head is bowed, if you are here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior and Lord and one who moves mountains for you, I want you to just raise your hand. 
Is there one here who has not received Christ? Amen, amen. We are all saved in the house. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise. Yes. The second call, and then I'm going to invite the choir to come back up. The second call is for membership. So we are uh, certainly inviting you to membership at Mount Zion. Dumbarton invites you to membership at Dumbarton if you'd like to become a member. It's just around the corner as well, um, and I'm sure uh, we will uh, receive you well. So contact us. There's a lot of contact information on these websites that you're going to see in the giving moment about how to contact our church if you are interested in becoming a member, or how to, co how to contact Dumbarton if you are interested in becoming a member. So that is our second call, to join your gifts and graces onto a church home if you do not have one. Amen. And now I'd like to invite us for another selection. From the marvelous Mount Zion Music Ministry, which is headed up by Brother Caleb Oates. Amen, amen.
Hallelujah. just have a few more items. One important thing is that now it is giving time. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> this is that special time to celebrate all that God is doing in and through Mount Zion and Dunbarton Church. Hallelujah. In fact, just on yesterday, Stuart, God let a church, our churches together serve 37 people who were hungry. Yes, and 26 came back for a second, so they had food later on. Thank you so much to Dunbarton and Mount Zion volunteers who fed uh, the, the, uh, home, the shelter challenge at the um, Saturday supper on yesterday. God is doing amazing things through these churches. And so um, we ask that you give to support the work that God is doing. So um, there are little things in your, in your pew about how to give electronically to Mount Zion. So um, those are those yellow little slips of paper that tell you the PayPal, they tell you the Cash App, they have the little QR code in there. We also are going to, that one's PayPal, can we go to the next one? And Cash App, there's so many ways to give, there's no excuse not to give. <laughs> it's that no excuse giving. And then the next one, or you can even mail in checks to Mount Zion. And then uh, the next one I wanted to share with you. Okay, there we go. So, hold your camera up to that, or if you're online there, that's the Dumbarton QR code is right there. And there's the link, skgiving.com slash app giving Dumbarton UMC. But I'm sure once you go to the, you can go to the website too and see the link so you can give electronically online, amen? We also have, we have, a, we have two plates in the back there, so if you want to put a check for Dumbarton on the way out, if you're okay with us doing it like that, <laughs> it's on the right, and the one from Mount Zion is on the left there. Uh, we appreciate any forms, any and all forms of giving, amen? We'd like to welcome, are there any visitors who are visiting for the first time to either Dumbarton or Mount Zion? Any visitors today? I know we had our, yes. <laughs> Yes, would you like to share your name with us? Our family who is here from? From Vienna, Austria. <laughs> Amen. Thank you for coming to worship with us. We really, really appreciate it. We hope that something that was said or sung or done here has been a blessing to you. There's another visitor? Is there, is there another one? Oh, yes, yes, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> oh. oh, wow. Well, welcome, Leslie. We are glad to have you visiting with us today. And thank you for helping out at the cemetery as well, which also holds so much rich history and needs to be preserved. And thank you so much. Um, okay. So I'd like to invite our guest pastor to come up and do an offertory prayer over the giving. Let us pray. Holy and loving creator, you are a generous giver. You provide all that we need, and there is more than enough. And so that is what we strive to be in our tithes and offerings too, O oh God, generous people. We've been sometimes reluctant to let go of our affinity for the things of this world and the things that we are so attached to. And so we dedicate these offerings to you because you are the greatest of all givers. In the name of the one whose name is above every name. In Christ we pray. Amen. 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 We also, um, we have a special uh, 
there is something going on in the life of the church at, at Dunbarton that um, we are blessed that you all have come to share with us today, but we know that there is a family who is moving out of the area. Is that correct, Pastor Rachel? Okay, and they would like to have a special goodbye at this time. Are there any particular prayer requests before we go to the Lord for our final song? I know the hour is growing late because we had such a full service today. <laughs> Usually we are good Methodists and we're out in one hour, but you know today was a special day. We had Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all you fathers. We had Juneteenth. We had a whole lot going on. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there somebody who's had a prayer request? Prayer request. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Mm. 
Amen, amen. We will lift up your brother John in that facility that he's in, that his care would be increased. Praise God for the wonderful music. I see the members of FUBS, Voices of Design in the choir. Thank you for your witness, says Jim and Willie Quinn online. All right, let's look to the Lord in prayer. God, as we come before your throne this last time, we know that we are not um, departing from your presence. And God, we know that you, you hear our prayers, you bend down low, and you give us the power to speak to those things that oppress us and move them. So we thank you, anything that's oppressing anybody's heart at this time, we pray that it would be moved. We pray that it would be replaced by your great joy. We pray in particular for John, that his care would be very careful and very loving, and that his uh, spirit would be encouraged by your spirit, and also by the people who, around him who uh, care for him. Thank you for his sister who has lifted him up in prayer. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. We're going to have a final closing song, and then um, we will have the benediction. But as, he, as Trey comes to bring, get prepared, I just want to remind you that the uh, movie Zoom that we're going to see, the Mount Zion movie after church. You're welcome to stay, those of you to sit downstairs, and we're going to hear from a few more of our uh, freed and actors before the movie starts at noon. And, um, but it's a different Zoom for those of you who are online. It's a different Zoom. It's not our worship Zoom. So again, check your e-blast and your message that I sent you this morning on the phone. It's a different Zoom. And um, uh, graduate Sunday is next Sunday, so please make sure your information is given to Sherelle. Um, the Bowman Memorial is next Sunday at 1 o'clock. Prayer meeting is this Friday. Uh, and also, downstairs and is some information about the African American Civil War Museum. They are having an event tomorrow. And uh, this is just more information about the African American Civil War Museum. So, please take note of any other announcements that have been sent to you through the mail.
So as we prepare to be sent forth in the name of God, who is creator, who is provider, who is love, who is truth teller, and we say to all the mountains in our own lives and in our own hearts and in the world, we say, move. And especially this day to the mountain of racism, we say, move. In the name of our God, amen. Yeah. <laughs>